Hello, it's another episode of Fiber Grinding's podcast, and uh, today our guest is uh, Daniel Kelm, uh, bookbinder and book designer, and I guess a chemist uh, from uh, Massachusetts, United States. Uh, uh, hello, Daniel. Hello. Very nice to be here with you, Stepan and Pavel. Did did you did I, did I introduce you well, or did I do something wrong? Oh, make something up. I always love it when people make something up. Um, uh, I've been to the moon twice. No, not really. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so I've been a bookbinder for, uh, you know, book artist for uh, almost 40 years now. But before that, I was a chemist, as you mentioned, a chemist. Uh, I, I fell in love with chemistry as a little kid, and it showed me a way of interpreting the physical environment and connecting to the physical environment that I carried over into my book arts. And the thing that really grabbed me for chemistry when I was a kid was that I was trying to make uh, perfume, you know, a 12 year old boy making perfume. It's just whatever smells, right? So I went around the house. I had a lab in the basement. My dad had, was a professional photographer and he had his portrait studio in the basement. And, uh, so I used to love watching uh, uh, him develop black and white photographs. It was like magic to be in the dark room and see that image develop on that white piece of paper. So I fell in love with chemistry and paper at that point and put up my lab uh, in the laundry room right next to his dark room. One day I put together all the smelly stuff I could find, uh, which included Clorox bleach, uh, good perfume uh, uh, material and uh, muriatic acid that I had gotten from the hardware store. Well, you get a big cloud of chlorine gas and I filled the basement with chlorine gas and I filled my lungs with chlorine gas. And I walked outside around the block for a couple of, a couple of times to try to uh, get my breath back. And when I came back to the uh, house, two things, two important things happened. My dad kicked me in the studio or in the uh, uh, lab out of the house, but I went down to a friend's basement and his mom would buy his chemicals, so it was even better. Um, but uh, a friend of my dad sat down with me and we wrote out the equation for the reaction that occurred to produce chlorine gas. And there I saw that reaction written on paper and I had still had the feeling of the gas in my lungs. So there was a mind body connection that was made um, through that experience. And that mind-body experience uh, is what I try to do in my book work. It's not just about text. It's not just about uh, imagery. It uh, incorporates, it integrates the binding into the narrative of whatever story is being told by that book object. And uh, uh, so that all started when I was, uh, when I fell in love with chemistry and then I went on to teach chemistry, study chemistry and teach chemistry at the University of Minnesota. And then one day I just felt like I was way too far up into my head and I really needed to get back down into my body and make stuff the way that I used to as a kid. So I looked around for uh, uh, something to do and I collected books. I love books. Uh, uh, I started, uh, you know, I taught chemistry, but I ended up with a degree in philosophy and uh, would sit in my walk-in closet covered with books during the Minnesota winter when it was 40 below outside. <laughs> and I felt like Faust. Uh, the library, the books were insulating me from the cold and it was really great. But after graduating or when I finally did graduate uh, with a degree in philosophy, I ran away from words. I felt Words are too cheap. I could, you know, pretty successfully argue any philosophical point, you know, and anybody can if you really work at it. And that just felt like there was a disconnection. Um, so uh, that light that went on in my head at that point, well, there were a couple of things. My philosophy uh, partner, Catherine, uh, kicked me in the shin really hard one day while I was espousing the uh, belief that only... Uh, the intellect gives us important information. And that kick in the shin brought me back into my body. And I thought, I got to use my body more. So I went right from the chemistry and philosophy departments at the university to the library bindery on campus and started making library bindings. Because I loved books. I just loved books. 
but I ran away from words. So what do I run away to? I run away to making books, which is kind of ironic. I guess I didn't want to go too far from books or from words, but uh, you'll see in my later work um, with wire edge binding, I often don't even put words into the uh, structures because I hand them to someone and they play with them. And it because it's interactive the way that a child's toy is, uh, they'll play with it for a while. There'll be a, a mind body um, connection and they start telling their own stories. So I look at them, some of them as devices for people to discover their own narratives, their own stories. Uh, could you take us back to that moment when you just started uh, to uh, evolve your style? I mean, I assume you, uh, you started by learning the basics and then, yes. you, then you transited into uh, the more artistic uh, the right. most uh, philosophical thing. Who was a major influence on you, or was it just you, know, uh, you, uh, uh, you yourself? Who influenced you? Well, learning book I mean, I came out of chemistry and science. I loved chemistry. So uh, when I left school and got the job binding books, I stayed at the library binding bindery for three months, I think. And uh, the shop manager there showed me an article about a bindery in Massachusetts in Boston, Harcourt Bindery, and they had a school there for traditional book arts or book binding. And also it was, um, you know, it had been founded in 1900. It used all the traditional leather and gold techniques. And so coming out of science and not having an art background, I went, I worked on the job. I learned, uh, I learned stuff in the library binding, even though I didn't stay there very long at Harcourt. I uh, took classes in uh, leather binding, but then I also uh, was given the job or offered the job, which I took, of uh, finisher and edge gilder. So I got to chase gold leaf around, but it was all learning the technique. And you know, the edge gilder that had been at Harcourt for years and years had retired and Sam Allenport and Joe Newman, uh, Sam owns Harcourt, had uh, tried to reestablish what that gilder had done. All the material was there, but he wouldn't tell anybody. He was so secretive that he just wouldn't share the information. So we had to reinvent it. So that was perfect for me because I'm an experimenter. So I looked at what materials and I changed the materials somewhat, but uh, you know, recreating kind of reverse engineering. Uh, looking at the materials that were used to make the uh, or to do the edge gilding. But there was an edge gilder who had been there uh, since World War II. So, or not an edge gilder, but a, a finisher. So Woody has a, had a lot of experience. But so here I am doing all of these traditional structures. And I think that that's the way to start. Learn the tradition, learn the materials, look at what's been going on forever, but then realize that none of that stuff I mean, someone made that stuff up, every bit of it at some point. So as long as you do a good job, you can make up new stuff yourself. And, uh, um, you know, at, at Harcourt, I was learning traditional stuff. Then I went to uh, the Western part of Massachusetts, about hundred miles uh, uh, west of Boston to work with David Bobo at Thistle Bindery. And he was, I mean, it was a hand bindery and it was doing editions of uh, small editions and one-offs uh, with the local artists here in the Western part of the state. So what I did was work with David for a while, then I started my own shop and I collaborated with the local book artists. And at that point there was Barry Moser of Penny Roll Press, uh, Alan James Robinson at Chalonidae Press, uh, Carol Blinn at Warwick Press uh, and a number of others um in this in the valley here and in the building that i'm still in this old factory building um there were i think at least seven binderies a paper maker a paper marbler um and then nearby uh, great letterpress printers well carol blinn is a good letterpress printer too but nearby some really great uh, dan kelleher at wild carrot letterpress Art Larson at Horton Tank Graphics, uh, and then many others a little bit farther out. So it was a hotbed of book arts to move into. And I was so lucky. I was the first book binder though that 
in the Valley when I moved out here that hadn't been trained by Arno Werner who was a German trained bookbinder who came to the States right at the beginning of World War II and set up his uh, shop. There were three, uh, uh, there were three groups or couples or an individual that came from Germany. It was the Gerlachs who went up uh, to New Hampshire and then Arno Werner was out here. And then uh, uh, the Eberhards who went to Philadelphia. So they were the early teachers too. Um, and when I moved to the Valley, all of these other people who were already here and established had all studied either with Arno, the German technique, or with one of Arno's students. So it was really interesting. I mean, I did things very differently because I did, I learned a lot at Harcourt and at, you know, another bindery that I worked at, but I, because I'm an experimenter, I just make stuff up. So I learned, you know, I continue to study leather binding, gold tooling, edge gilding. Well, not so much edge gilding anymore, but the others and really love those old techniques. And, uh, but I'll show you, uh, you know, let's see, I, I, do I have one that I've got some good wire edge models to show you and uh, finish books, but there's a, you know, I was doing these traditional leather bindings, gold tooling, uh, onlay, that sort of thing. And then I started putting sculpture under the leather so that it became a relief surface. And some of the purists, even out here, uh, like, um, oh, um, Gehenna Press, um, I'm blanking on his name, but I'll think of it in a, in a minute. Um, he was giving a lecture at Wellesley College and I went and he said that if you put a, a sculpture on the front of a book, it stops being a book. And I stood up, I was pretty new to the whole thing. And I said, you know, if it still functions as a book, it's still a book, yeah, you exactly. know? And it gives you the added yeah. sensation of the sculpture in your hands. Um, and also there's the history of it. Yeah. For, uh, for 1500 years, sculptures have been put on the covers of the books. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he, you know, some people uh, just have very narrow definitions, right? So if something is outside of that definition, then it's not acceptable. Well, I grew up as, you know, my parents were Lutheran in Northern, in Minnesota, you know, out in the plains and it, you couldn't get too much more restrictive in your lifestyle. So as a young man, I kind of re responded to that and decided that wasn't the way I wanted to do it. So I'm always asking questions. I'm always with an open mind. I try to keep an open mind to anything so that um, I can just play and have fun and come up with new things. People every once in a while would ask, well, how do you come up with all these new ideas? And you know what it is really, it's a leap of faith. Um, I'm not a religious person, I'm a spiritual person, but not a religious person. But I always feel like if I want to figure something out, I'll either dream about it. And often I'll come up with a solution in a dream and wake up with it the next morning, including to, I, I figured out a rope trick one time staying at a friend's house and they had this rope puzzle and I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning, I walked right up to it and did it. You know, it was kind of cool. Uh, I, I really wanted to to return even even more back maybe uh, when you were talking about uh, this uh, creative society a mix of different workshops you, oh, yeah. you you've mm -hmm. been part of uh, uh, this uh, this brought me to some maybe sad so thoughts because uh, I, I started thinking about uh, uh, how it was in in Soviet Union because uh, uh, of course there were creative collectives in Soviet Union and some of them were supported by government some of them were not supported by government and uh, were punished because of that but then that there, there really wasn't this chance to you know to to bring uh, or to welcome all the different businesses in one place and uh, create this synergy because there were no creative businesses. There were only creative, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies of people mm -hmm. uh, who were owned by government, not, not people owned sure, by sure. government, but, but, you know, organizations. And uh, that's an absolutely different approach. And, uh, and uh, we've got this sort of... Uh, uh, creative, you know, uh, places only later 
not even in early 90s when the when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, but uh, I guess closer to end of 90s. Uh, maybe pa Pavel will be able to chip in on this mm -hmm. on this matter. But uh, so you in, in this way you had so so great head start, and this is so so mm -hmm. so nice. And uh, you know uh, I'm a bit envious <laughs> because now of course uh, we and other creative people can have this opportunity if nothing changes mm -hmm. even more to, to, to the wars in Russia. But uh, so many years passed and so many chances were lost. And uh, this is just uh, yep. yeah, sad. Oh, and I, I felt that, uh, you know, I, I realized that we were really lucky here because, uh, you know, I would look at what, um, you know, friends would tell me from Europe and I was look at different journals and, you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of beautiful work coming out of designer bookbinders and other groups. Uh, but it was very traditional. In fact, let's see, we had uh, a young man who had just earned his, uh, oh, what was he? It was a master of machines. He worked at uh, Buchbinderei Mergemeier in Dusseldorf. And uh, he came over here for a month after he earned his master's papers. And, um, you know, he spent most of his time at our local hardware store because he said he couldn't find that kind of resource in one place. So it was always funny. If you needed to find him, you knew where he was. But, uh, you know, he told me stories and I heard stories from other people about what work was being done. And now since he came over, you don't have to earn a master's rating from the German Guild in order to call yourself a bookbinder. But at that point, you did. You know, it was all pretty regulated. Uh, when I first came to the Valley, a couple of friends, uh, Sarah Creighton and Claudia Cohen, who were working with Gray Perot and then starting their own business, uh, went to Ascona to study with uh, Hugo Peller. And uh, they came back. And here I am, you know, I've worked in a couple of binderies. I probably at that point was set up on my own here in the built. Well, I was in the Valley, maybe not in the building yet, but... Uh, I said, hey, you guys want to see what I'm doing? And I was doing a leather binding and they looked at me and said, well, you can't do it that way. I'm going, you know, I look at them like, well, it works. You know, why can't I do it this way? He said, because my master told me you had to do it this way. And it's like, I realized at that moment, I hadn't had the money, money to go to Europe. I mean, there, there's a tradition there and we've got mm, a moderate tradition here in comparison for the, uh, for the old styles and for experience, but I realized I wouldn't have done well because I'm always experimenting. I'm always <laughs> trying new stuff. And, uh, you know, and that's what, when I started my own studio, I just thought I'm going to do traditional stuff, but I want to do, I want to push the envelope. I want to keep going with it and see what else is possible. Even if it, you know, it's, you know, maybe traditional structures with modern materials or integrating them somehow. Uh, but what I did do, and this is to come back to a thread that we had earlier, is that I put sculpture on the covers. And then I finally, I did that enough, both with uh, sculpted leather and with cast paper, that I thought, well, what if there was no difference between the cover and the text? And that's where wire edge binding came in for me. Uh, because it's, you know, it's panels, they can be any shape. Um, you put some sort of anchor in one or two or all edges that uh, will uh, have a little bit of exposed wire right at the edge. And then you can sew or not from that to the next panel. And it made it solved the problem of a really flexible binding with stiff material. Because early on in my career, I was... Uh, I would do books for photographers or just friends with photographs. And sometimes the photographic paper was really heavy. So the challenge, of course, was to make something that opened really well with material that had no drape to it at all. And uh, uh, when I made my first little model of wire edge, uh, I thought, this is it. And I've d developed it in lots of different ways and uh, different systems and styles, interior wire, exterior wire. Uh, I do a lot of metal covers, uh, but you can do glass as well. I've done some glass. Uh, so it just opened up 
a new uh, avenue for me. And uh, a question that you asked uh, earlier too was, uh, Pavel, uh, who inspired me? Well, it was, I came out here, I'm still learning bookbinding. I'm still learning bookbinding after 40 years, I'm still learning bookbinding and book arts. But I collaborated with all these different artists that are here and I developed my own or you know, discovered my own artistic voice just on the job. And that's where I've done most of, of everything that I've done. Uh, you know, some training where it was available, but here in this country, well, it was really while I was at Harcourt and uh, the English bookbinders started coming over, Bernard Middleton, Don Etherington. I don't think he, they must, he must have moved here after that. That would have been in the late seventies. And uh, uh, I remember Bernard, a good friend of Sam Allen Ports came over, did a workshop, uh, it was really instrumental for me. It was a rebacking workshop, but the thing that really blew me away was he came Sam finally relented. We all said, let Bernard into the shop and let him watch us work and make comments. Sam finally relented and uh, Bernard came in and watched uh, forwarding and finishing, forwarding mainly, and gave us tips that I still use to this day. You know, it's that kind of experience that you really want to, uh, you know, talk to, talk with. So that, and then another workshop at Harcourt. So I did do workshops. Uh, let's see, Sam invited Gary Frost, uh, who was then a conservator at the uh, Newbury Library in Chicago. And, uh, but he was always experimenting and doing different things. Well, he was working on medieval bindings at that point. And he came and did a workshop on that. And his, his thought about the whole thing was that if the all the stress, if you open a heavy board, make evil, bind, make, uh, make evil, <laughs> make, um, medieval binding, um, you know, you'll open the board and the fly will come up with it, right? And then text, you know, maybe another text page will come up with it. And he said that that indicates that all the stress is not just at the leather joint, it's shared through the structure because of the movement that it induces as you open and close a book. And he said, in contradistinction, the Victorian leather binding, the ideal was open the board all the way back on itself and not have the first fly, uh, the uh, end sheet fly come up at all. And so I thought that was an interesting distinction because I didn't know how to think about this kind of stuff, the dynamics of opening and closing books until that point I started thinking about it. And as counterpoint to what Gary was saying, Joe Newman, who was the shop manager at Harcourt and a, a collector of Victorian style bindings, uh, argued the other side. He said, the book is better protected. The text block is better protected uh, if nothing opens on the text block when you open the board. And then the came around to, well, that's the joint's gonna break at some point. So how much does that protect? the uh, text block. And then Joe said, well, you just re, uh, um, re-back it, you know, and that's what Bernard yes. had been teaching. So we were learning that. Uh, but I really <clears throat> liked what Gary was saying. First of all, I loved the interaction, the, the, uh, the dialogue, because it started giving me ideas about how to think about the dynamics uh, of book structure and the movement of book structure. And uh, so that was that was eye opening for me. So when I started doing wire edge bindings that I call articulated sculpture, I get heckled sometimes for the book objects that I make. And uh, once was at the Presidio in San Francisco's co-sponsored presentation and book binders of California and another group out there. And I showed some of my structures. I was doing a slideshow and someone actually yelled from the audience, those that's not a book. And I say, excuse me, that's not a book. And I looked at my host, Peter Koch, who's since then has founded the Codex uh, Foundation and Codex uh, Conference. And uh, I said, Peter, I'm not gonna put up with this. I'm, and I put the, the uh, mic down and I walked off stage and then I walked right back on. I said, that was fun, let's do that some more. And, uh, you know, so not everybody, not everybody likes the kind of sculptural approach that I take, but arguably there, it shares so many 
book elements, you know, surface, hinging, open form, compact form, uh, doesn't show uh, all the surfaces at one time. So there's a process of going through it. Uh, some of them are actually uh, volumes, and I'll show one um, that is a volume. And, you know, that, so books don't have hidden volume or hidden, hidden interior space, but otherwise it's got all the rest of it. So um, I just, you know, I just like to experiment and I like to make new things. And early on in my career, I decided that I was going to learn as much about as many materials and as many structures as possible, traditional uh, structures and materials, and then modern also, because I, if an idea came to me or if a client came to me and wanted me to bind a book, I wanted to know what the book was, what it was about, what the uh, readers experience, how that could be enhanced. And I chose materials and structure accordingly. Uh, it kind of drives me crazy when someone learns one structure and then tries to apply that to everything. You know, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's kind of where I'm. I wanted to 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 go first, Pavel. This time, yeah. I I wanted to 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 make a sort of a point uh, about uh, uh, wire edge binding because you described it a lot and you you described uh, uh, why you uh, uh, started making this structure. But I I wanted to make a point that this is a structure that you invented some time ago, and mm -hmm. it's not just you started following some other bookbinder, but it's it's it was your invention and. Uh, I, I just wasn't sure that it was clear from your previous oh, words, sure, and, sure. and I and I wanted to ask that uh, uh, when did it happen? Because you you described uh, what were the reasons for this structure to appear, but uh, yeah. when did it happen? I think it was around eighty four, eighty five. I wrote an essay about it, and I think that's somewhere in that that range, eighty four, eighty five. Uh, I was out here. Let's see, I was in Boston. Yeah, I had moved out here to the Valley from Boston after being at Harcourt. And I was starting to do some of my own stuff. And, you know, it was, that was a time when you could, I could just do my own stuff and send it to galleries and they'd sell it. And uh, both, you know, um, leather bindings, but also uh, design bindings or uh, my artist books, because uh, there was just a lot of interest in collecting all sorts of things back then. That's changed a little bit. That's tightened up some or shifted from traditional to uh, artist books more. But uh, yeah, it came out of uh, wires binding, as I mentioned, came out of my box making. I was making this fancy box. In fact, I've got the model I can show you. And this flap needed a clip on it. And I put a wire in the edge of the flap and then attach a clip to it to close the flap. And that's when I looked at it and thought, I could make books like that. So it just came out of, uh, you know, uh, uh, just doing stuff and uh, really looking at it. That's one thing that I always, when I have students, and I've had a lot of students, uh, I've been teaching now for 50 years, I realized first it was chemistry and then uh, book arts after maybe a five year period where I was just learning as much about book arts. I didn't teach as much because I needed to really learn first. Um, but you know, keeping an open mind and asking questions and figuring out how to look at something, really truly look at it. So if a student hands me a book that they're working on or a box or anything and says, what do you think? I always ask, I just take it and I look at them and I say, what do you see here? What do you like about this? What do you not like about it? What works for you? What doesn't work? Uh, tell me what level of detail you can see. Um, you know, it's just important to develop a, a real eye for it. Because say, you know, traditionally you pick up a leather binding and of course you look at the caps and you look at the turn, uh, um, you know, the squares and everything. And we've developed an eye for that. But if someone doesn't have an eye for detail, they're not going to be able to figure out how to influence their work in the direction that they want to go. So if someone says, oh, this board just doesn't open flexibly enough, I'd really like it to do that. At least now there's a starting point and you can say, okay, so why is it not opening uh, very easily? And then you look at the leather, is it too much leather on the outside? So the board doesn't uh, have the flexibility, is it too tight on the inside? Even just 
you know, warp on paper. I've had clients who have uh, received work from me uh, when it was really dry here and really wet where they are. And then the pages start to cockle and they panic. Well, there's always a way to figure any of this stuff out if you can see what's really going on. So that's, yeah, developing an eye. I think that's, uh, that's really a big part of it. I really wanted to ask you a bit more about uh, when a book is not a book and when uh -huh. something that doesn't, uh, that doesn't look like a book is still one. Could you okay. give some, some examples of the least book-like books that you've ever made? And mm -hmm. also, surely there, there is a certain line even for you. When is a book mm -hmm. no longer a book? Well, I'm, you know, since having that revelation that emotions are important to one's life, not just the intellect, I've been opening to the physical environment in a way that uh, um, I hadn't before. And so with this open mind, I, I've gone well beyond traditional codex form. And as I said, I get heckled uh, for it. People will say, is this a book? And I say, well, a book dealer sells it. So does that qualify? You know, for me, the question is, well, I guess the way I think about it is, um, again, breaking it down a little bit and saying, okay, what makes a book? Of course, you know, I was a philosopher and that's the first question. Someone asks you a question, you have to, well, define your terms, you know? So, uh, so what is a book? And uh, one fellow that worked with me, Mark Tomlinson, I had a big uh, lectern uh, dictionary out, was on a bench top, but he went over to it and he slammed it shut. And I mean, that, boof, that sound, he said, it has to make that sound for it to be a book. And I thought, hmm, I must make clackers then because my books clack now. Um, but, you know, I think surface, well, let's go even, I think the thing that is so great about books is the relationship that you have to them, you know? And I'm an avid reader. I, I did stop. I ran away from words for quite a while, maybe five years after college, but I came back to it. Uh, you know, and I realized that a story can sweep you away. It can make a, con a constructed environment that sweeps you away and you're not, your body's not moving at all. You're just reading. Um, and then I, you know, looking at books that fell apart, like uh, badly made um, perfect bindings, you know, paperback bindings. Uh, people would say, well, I'm just going to toss that and uh, get another one. Well, I said, there's, that's adding to the story that you're experiencing with this book. You could be reading Jane Eyre or anything. If the book falls apart, that little bit of narrative is, that, is a denigration of the body. The body of this book is not important. Uh, it falls apart, get a new one. And so commercial books, sure, that way. But for me, I really wanted to um, integrate all the elements. And so to find structures that could interact with the reader in a way that would really do that for a particular story was my goal. So that's what really motiv motivated me to look at these non-traditional, what I call sculptural books. But arguably they have surface, they have movement. As I said before, they have a compact form, an expanded form. They don't reveal all the information. There's an interaction, they're of a scale that you can interact with them. In fact, one of the first ones that I did was for uh, Peter Garrity's wedding. You guys uh, had Peter, I did a couple blogs with Peter recently and uh, we were we worked together at Harcourt, and then we I came out here first and worked with David Robo. But then when I found and Bill Streeter, but then when I found the space here in the building, I called Peter in Boston. I said, Peter, there's a huge space here. Please come out and share it with me. It's bigger than I'll ever need it a uh, space to be. Well, 750 square feet, and at my top I was at 3,300 square feet. Now I'm kind of peeling back from that a little bit because I don't do the big classes anymore here. Um, but, um, oh, reel me back in. Where, were we, where, where did that start? When is a book no longer Oh, when a is book? a book not a book? Okay, so I avoided that question pretty well there for a short while telling that other story. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I think 
for me, a book, you know, I've seen static book sculptures don't really do much for me. If you can't interact with it with some way, I think it it loses its bookness. You know, I've seen examples of sculptural open books, you know, a book in its open form done in glass on a pedestal. It's a book. Well, I don't, it's a book sculpture. I would give it that, but it's not a sculptural book. You know, it's a book sculpture. It, it borrows something from, from bookness. Uh, just the way that paintings, you know, a painting, uh, the planar surface of that painting hanging on the wall, you see, I mean, you could go back to certain paintings over and over again and see different things. If, there, if there's a lot going on on the surface. I went to the Bosch exhibit in uh, Southern Holland five years ago and was blown away by the richness of those surfaces, you know, just amazing. But you go and you look at it, you scan the whole thing and you've seen it. But with a book, it requires multiple movements and uh, interactions and uh, can take you back in. Uh, there's always more to see. Now, some paintings have that too, but a painting I don't consider a book. Uh, maybe someone would hang a book on a painting and that could be the book. But for me, you know, it just, um, if it's, if you can't interact with it, then in any way, but visual, non-tactile, tactile. Tactile comes into it for me, for books. So I think that's where the transition from books to art kind of shows its face. Uh, you know, books are considered utilitarian. So book arts have had a real heavy go being accepted into the art world, right? So, um, and that's partly because of utility. Books have always been thought of as uh, utilitarian. So how can they be fine art? Well, if fine art is non-utilitarian, I want, I'm making something in between. You know, I think book arts spans between the two. The big difference, of course, the book market, I could make something and I've done this. I've made something, not the same thing, but just in comparison, if I sell it in the book market and literally if I sold the same thing in the art market, it could be priced five times higher. You know, it's just one of these weird things. And it's the whole thing about canvas for paintings, canvas versus paper. Tim Ely is an old friend of mine and I love his work and it's just rich. But so many times it's always on paper. So many times he's been told, well, you could sell this for more if you painted this stuff on uh, canvas. So he really responded badly to that and started pricing his books by the square inch, I think. He just said, okay, this is valuable. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the formula and then you can buy it or not. Um, you know, but there are these, and the funny thing is these are all constructs, right? So I said that I was a chemist and I love chemistry. Chemistry is a construct. It's just a really good story. It's a really consistent story about a certain aspect of the physical environment. And that's why I liked it. It was non-emotional when I was a kid. I found solace in chemistry because I could understand the environment, but um, not bring emotion into it until I finally did. Um, but uh, for me, the relationship to the book is so important and I wanna be able to hold it. And so when I had my, uh, a big one person show over at Smith College Museum of Art uh, uh, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, you know, everything was gonna be under glass in cases. And the question came up, if no one can interact with these, uh, are they still books? You know, we were talking about that and they're still books, they're in there. You can take them out. And we did that for one hands-on session through the uh, show. But, you know, I thought, can I make some sort of mechanical link from the outside of the case to the book so that you can move the book around mechanically? And that just proved to be too big of a, a stretch. So we did videos, you know, of me handling the books and talking about the books. So if you go to the Smith College website, you can find in their archives of uh, exhibits, uh, the video. And, uh, you know, that was the best I could come up with, but they have to move. Someone has to be able to interact with them, I think, for it to be a book. 
Does that address your question, Pavel, or, or your comment, or what would you say? Yeah, about yeah. That? We, uh, we've been discussing it with uh, uh, with other uh, people, and one of our regular guests, uh, Mark Copram from London, who's a book artist, mm -hmm. uh, he actually mm, he partly shares your views, but also plays with those expectations. Uh, he buries books on the ground, uh -huh. uh -huh. fixing yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. their shape, and then they get uh, sort of rigor mortis. Yeah. You know, they're fixed into that, that shape. And uh, here you are, you are seeing what is clearly a book. He only mm -hmm. buries the books mm -hmm. uh, he makes himself, yeah? And yeah. in theory, you should be able to open them, but you also can't. And uh, that makes them... Uh, but then it's more of a sculpture made out of a book. The, yeah, the see, I would call that a book. I would call that a book sculpture or a sculptural book. I would call that a sculptural book versus a book sculpture, which I would consider static and has no way of going through the elements that I, I described. Uh, there are a lot of people that do that weathered books. You know, I think that's really cool because then the reader is the the elements outside. It's the weather, you know, so that puts its touch on this book and adds to the information of it. Now you can't, if it's twisted around and you can't open it up, it's not for the original information, but there's other information imported into it or added to it by the form and how it's responded to its environment. I mean, our writing, writers, you know, authors are responding to their environment, right? So here's an example of a physical object um, responding to its environment. So I think that's kind of cool, but I would, you know, I would differentiate that from a functional book uh, because you can't use the book that it was originally printed, but that, that doesn't make any difference. I, you know, if you can interact with it, I would, I would stretch, I would stretch. Does it still have to have words in it? Uh, do you have to be able to read a book? Uh, I think you can read the surface, you can read the shape, you can read the form. And as I mentioned, some of my uh, articulated sculptural books um, don't have any words on them. But what I do, and I'll show you one, it doesn't have any words on it, and you play with it, and you start telling your own stories, you identify shapes and things like that, which adds to the narrative. But in the box with, the, uh, with that object, I put a narrative. Um, Often my, my artist books will have a pamphlet or two, Mars, one that I did uh, with uh, iron, um, had a letterpress printed, um, <clears throat> just a one single spread, and that was the voice of Mars, uh, which I couldn't write. I'm just not martial enough. Uh, so I had, uh, my wife and I had her ex-wife, her, her ex-husband, write that text because he could re write it perfectly and really express Mars. And the last line in that was, because I talk about Mars, uh, my father was very martial. And, uh, and then he ends it, Mars, Mars's voice with, I am your father. And it always gives me goosebumps. But there's that voice of the element that I'm trying to express in this book and then there's also a written narrative, uh, my written narrative of the project and what I was trying to do with it and what different things symbolized for me. And so I think all that information is important. Uh, Mark Demination, uh, the curator of Rare Books uh, Special Collections at uh, the Library of Congress, uh, uh, when I talk with him, you know, he in the past, he'd say, and I always do it, you know, so he's talking about other people, but he said, you know, if I'm showing someone's book, and I don't know what it's about, really, if I've just purchased it, and I haven't talked with the artist, uh, I can't really just, I can't show it properly. So I need more information. So I do that. I put that information in with the sculptural book. So there are words, and each of those pieces would be considered a book in my mind. But I'll show you examples so that you see uh, more what I'm talking about. Maybe you continue a bit uh, uh, with the sculptural books and uh, uh, the, th the thing that you uh, told a bit earlier that uh, you need to keep your open mind uh, 
uh, well, I guess always, not only when you are making books or making art or something like that, it's, I, I think it's better to keep, keep an open mind <laughs> always. Mm -hmm. And your meetings with this uh, sort of book binding conservatism is when uh, somebody will tell you, well, that's not a book. Mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 what do you feel about the difference between, I don't know, late 1970s, 1980s and the modern time? Because in, in my opinion, uh, uh, many things have changed and uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, much easier for people to experiment these days. And uh, there will be less, less people who will tell, well, that's not a book and you are doing it all wrong. And mm -hmm. uh, well, there still are people who say things like mm -hmm. that. It's mm -hmm. just uh, no, nobody listens to them anymore, hopefully. So yeah, what, there are fewer what's people. your opinion? What's the change? Yeah. How, how well, it is that's... now compared to how it was then? Sure. Well, I started uh, book mining in 77, 78. So that's when I was first getting into it. And, uh, you know, I had mentioned uh, the opportunities for studying in Europe um, and the strength of the guild, at least in Germany. Uh, when I realized that we didn't have any of that, I rather lamented it at first, but then I realized that because we didn't have that real strong tradition here, we were free to experiment right from the get-go. So that's that, you know, we had a little bit of a head start, and that's what it felt like, because the, uh, the structure of book binding in Europe was rather restrictive, you know, what you could do or couldn't do, or how you could earn a living? Could you put a sign out saying that you were a, a book binder if you weren't uh, registered or, you know, you hadn't earned your papers? So it was both a, a weakness for us because we didn't have the people except the ones that came over uh, to really show us traditional structures, but we were also playing like crazy. You know, 77, 78, I was already starting to experiment and look at different things. Now, you know, designer bookbinders was uh, with Bernard Middleton coming over and others coming over. Uh, that was the big influence. So that was leather bindings. You know, they had a list of, well, even going back to the Guild of Book Workers here in the States, I remember seeing that, that 1910, I think there was a list of criterion for exhibition books. You couldn't sand the leather. You couldn't add an extra dye to the leather. You couldn't do anything to the leather, basically. You could do onlays and tooling, and that was it. Otherwise, it was disqualified as a uh, book that was able to be exhibited. And then, you know, designer bookbinders uh, opened up the whole uh, putting the design on the outside, something that would represent the text, which I thought was a great uh, advance. Um, you know, to bring the interior to the exterior like that. But there were still a lot of regulations. You know, for a while, you had to have a suede de bloor and you had to have uh, leather binding and, and all of this stuff of a traditional a codex structure. And uh, I just, I, I thought, you know, that was restrictive. I love the work. I looked at it. I can remember seeing uh, an exhibition of Mike Wilcox's work uh, uh, at the Met in uh, at the Watson Library at the Met in New York. And uh, that was the last uh, show that they had of living book artists. Now they only uh, show deceased book artists. And, or at least they did after that show. And I looked at it and it was gorgeous. Mike's work is so good. It's just so good. Um, but I thought, you know, if I can't do exactly this, I can do something as good as this. And that just seeing what Mike was able to do uh, really inspired me. So, um, but I just keep going back to make, you know, whenever I do a workshop, I'm saying, I'm showing you how I'm doing this myself, but this isn't chiseled in stone, uh, make it your own. Um, you know, with wire edge binding, people said, aren't you gonna um, patent it? And I said, no, I don't wanna patent it. I want it to be part of the, uh, become the vernacular, part of the book binding vernacular. And uh, I started seeing ads for people that were offering uh, wire edge binding. And I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I'm not protective of it. I want to share it. I think that's, we need, we need that. And that's why I love the community here. Everybody shared, you know, I hear from friends and well, I went to a bindery in uh, Bristol, uh, England. And there was a fellow, this was back in the early 90s, he had uh, 
oh, we discovered how to do tree marbling. And it was beautiful. And I said, are you teaching this? He said, nope, I'm just going to die with me. Well, since then, other people have rediscovered the technique and have taken it forward and are teaching it. But I thought, what a strange attitude. We should share. We should just uh, um, have fun and show people how we do things. Because everybody, oh, the neighbor dog just came in. So licking my hand for a moment. Oh, Charlie. I'll see you later, Charlie. Um, so uh, uh, share, and everybody does it differently. So no one's going to do it exactly the way that you do it anyway. So uh, I just encourage people to make stuff their own, figure it out. And my teaching method, uh, you know, Socratic, I ask questions because what I, I try to share my, uh, my process with people so that they see me confronted by a certain, oh, challenge. <clears throat> and so how do I think about it? And part of it is developing the eye. Part of it is just being open. Part of it is looking at it and deciding what you like and you don't like. And then um, I do that with people so that when they're standing at the bench in their studio and they have a challenge, they can start hearing their own internal process. They can have a dialogue with themselves and go through a process that hopefully will bring them to a solution for whatever is challenging them at that point. And uh, I mean, I use that in my work, but I also, that's how I live too. It's really uh, not a big distinction for me. I don't know if that answered your question or the direction you wanted to go, uh, Stepan, but, but ask another oh, one. Oh, sorry, for me, it certainly generated more questions. OK. Uh, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I, uh, uh, I've read about uh, uh, you teaching many workshops and uh, founding a school. Uh, but, uh, but do you also have you uh, also ever trained anyone in-house, like a traditional apprenticeship? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apprentice. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, an apprenticeship, an apprenticeship, I mean, there's a real strong definition for apprenticeship uh, that goes back a ways in this country because of the uh, probably library boundaries, uh, that sort of thing. But apprenticeships uh, are paid positions. So I do often what I would call a, uh, a residency, an internship internship, well, I can't remember, or a student, you know. Uh, but yes, I do train people in-house uh, and um, I've run into some wonderful people. I've had a lot of crews over the years. Uh, you know, at probably the biggest I had, maybe three or four people working with me. Uh, there was actually a group of four people that worked with me that got to be such close friends and they were always cooking. So we had wonderful food in the studio during that time. And it was just really fun because they loved each other and uh, got along really well. And it just made the studio a fun place to be. And they were all really good at, uh, at the work, including uh, Kylene Lee, who now is in uh, Switzerland. Uh, she was here for years and uh, um, at, as a, well, she was a student and contacted me because she had gone to Ireland and done a little bit of book work there and came back and wanted to do it after she graduated from local college. And she ended up working with me for, I think, seven or eight years. And, uh, um, and then I've got an assistant now, Erin uh, Clay Nelson, who was part of that group. And uh, uh, she still works with me part time now, years later. And so, yes, I do, I liked, I like sharing the information and sharing the experience and uh, watching people develop their own artistic voice and their own uh, skills. I think that's really exciting. So, uh, yep, I started the school in 1990. I was funny, uh, Dan Tucker started the AHA school, which became uh, the parent for the American Academy of Bookbinding in 1990 and uh, he called me up and said dan i started a school and i said dan i started a school too well his had better funding so his is still around uh, i ran the school until oh maybe about my wife and i ran it until maybe uh we did big classes 12 students at a time and a long schedule uh, until about five years ago maybe a little bit longer but uh it had a good run you know it's about 25 years or so um 
And I just, I love that environment of sharing information and seeing people have that aha moment, you know, where they go, oh, that's how you do that, or that's how I can do that, you know? So, yes. But, but you still continue to teach uh, classes and students. Oh, I do more private teaching now than the big groups. Uh, um, this has a happy ending, but almost, well, about four and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And, uh, you know, that was a big kick in the butt. And uh, I was given at that time by the docs at Mass General uh, three to five years to live if the treatment worked. And here I am pushing five years now. So I'm going to go a lot longer than what they were projecting. But that's where the openness comes in. You know, my wife and I immediately took this on as uh, I can't control anything. I may have said that already. I'm not looking to control anything, including book materials. I'm always in collaboration and uh, communication with what's around me, the environment. So the cancer became something else to really uh, hold and embrace and work with. And uh, I feel uh, healthier now than I've ever felt in my life because I really looked at my diet and exercise and everything else, how I spend my time. I used to be a workaholic. I would work. I was called the night watchman here at the studio because I would, I did four all nighters in a row for one project to get it done in time, you know, and that just takes age, eight years off your life. Uh, so I used to just work all the time, but then I finally realized that I did that at the exclusion of everything else in my life. So opening up to things other than work have really benefited my health. And, uh, you know, I still, well, I told during a family Zoom meeting, I said, well, the big difference is I stay home on weekends, but uh, so I'm only working Monday through Friday. And I thought when I said that, I thought, well, that's kind of a normal thing for people to do, isn't it? So I still work a lot, but nothing like I used to. And I'm a lot happier, you know, it's just like, yeah, okay. So there are other things and I love my work. I love making stuff, but uh, uh, connecting and relationship. And that was, I thought of that because of teaching. Teaching is all of our relationship, you know, it's about um, really communicating with someone else and being open to what they have to say and asking questions. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do something. And if someone asks me, why do you do it that way? I've only been stumped once uh, because I'm pretty, uh, I think about what I do and I try lots of different things and I pick the things that work best for me. Um, but if I say, you know, why do you do that that way? And they say, well, my teacher told me that. And I said, why did they tell you that? And they say, well, that's how they were shown, that's not good enough. It's just not enough. You need to really uh, think about what you're doing, put your body and your heart into it, but integrate mind and body and heart and spirit and everything and bring it to your work. Uh, that's the way to really do a good job of it. And be process oriented. I, I guess work-life balance is something that's uh, really uh, hard achievable uh, for, for um craftspeople and artisans oh, and uh, yeah. i just 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 a couple of weeks ago i discussed with somebody that uh, my current plan is to uh, make it uh, that uh, i i have two uh, two rest days uh, each week mm -hmm. because uh, nowadays i only i only rest on saturdays and i i, I start working <laughs> on on sunday yeah yeah and uh, my plan is like uh, to have a full weekend for 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 the rest only and not not thinking about work and stuff and then i was like well, but yeah, I like, like you told it, uh, well, it's just most normal, normal people do. <laughs> they mm -hmm, have five mm -hmm. days for work and then yeah, two, yeah. two days for rest. And, and it was like a new thought for me or something. Oh, I know so, it. Isn't it remarkable? Yeah. Yes. And it helps you. It, yeah, it yeah. feeds your soul to do yeah. that too. So you can bring that to your work. Yeah. yeah and on Saturdays, yeah. I, I really veg out. My wife and I veg out in the morning. It's really fun. You know, it's kind of like a nice entry into a two day weekend. But what I realized recently is that, you know, my studio is pretty well developed and I've had lots of different studios. I put a lot of energy into the space because I think if the space is difficult to work in, it shows in your work. You know, you need to work in a way in an environment that really is conducive to the work. Otherwise it shows. So I've done that a lot, but I never did that at home until you know, maybe my uh, cancer diagnosis, you know, and then I get this kick in the butt. I got to spend my time differently. I started putting on weekends a lot of that energy that I used to put into my studio at home. And 
I built a last year, a little over a year ago, I built an infrared sauna that both of us can go into. So we do saunas. I built a uh, garden chamber so I can grow, uh, uh, you know, we grow herbs and wheatgrass for juicing. And then, you know, pots, cannabis is legal here in Massachusetts now. So I have my plants up on top there. And it's just, it's another way of connecting and relating to nature. I guess, I guess Pavel just got very envious at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> I know, what a difference, what a difference it makes. <laughs> because we're yeah. in the Netherlands and it's easy oh, to get anything here. Oh, of uh, it's, course. It's, it's not really legal to, to grow it, but it's not illegal as well so well i've been uh, to the no, greenhouse nobody no, yeah. nobody, nobody no. can punish you for that <laughs> i've been uh, to the greenhouse there and i've been to bulldog a number of yeah. times too yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not, yeah. So, not so much in moscow no i'm <laughs> sorry i'm so sorry it's really a nice change i mean it's still illegal federally but all the states are starting to reevaluate it's that. a question of well, time i yeah. i hope it, it it will it will change pretty soon because yeah. it, it really seems that, that uh, the changes to changes are coming oh yeah and also you know growing things inside during the winter i mean we're having a really cold winter it's uh, gotten down below zero not much i grew up in minnesota i like a good cold winter and lots of snow uh it's not as much out here on the east coast but we've got some snow on the ground it's just beautiful but to go downstairs and to tend to plants in this you know really nicely designed three by three uh foot square so about a meter square footprint and about two meters plus tall and uh you know with doors and lights and automatic uh, regulation of humidity and temperature and that sort of thing so it just it it really works well everything's growing well and it's a nice nice thing to do it's a nice way to be during the winter oh and this and especially this last year mm. without, oh. without, without without my plants i uh, i really doubt i'd, uh, I'd keep my yeah. sanity yes uh, because because when, when you can no longer touch other people right you can still inter interact with your plants you can yes. still put your energy into them and um and get, and get the results and get the joy of, of looking at them. They respond. Yeah, they absolutely respond. Yeah. I, I, I always say that plants need three things, sun, water, and attention. Yes. <laughs> if you don't look at them, they won't grow. No, well, why do you have them if you're not going to look at them and talk to them and play with them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned uh, I really wanted to ask you a bit more about it. When you say that you like to interact with your materials, uh, 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 to listen to them and to go with, uh, with the flow, so many book binders, it would seem to me, only try to force their own will on, mm. on the material. Mm -hmm. And uh, it often shows when the book, uh, book feels constrained, not, uh, not organic. Mm. Uh, could, could you perhaps describe your process or give some examples? How mm -hmm. does that, how does that interaction that plays go? Yeah, so, you know, I, I've talked a lot about chemistry. Con chemistry is a contact process and I learned organic chemistry and I apply that to my work. Not, I mean, the organic is good for conservation stuff, but I'll, I'll describe what I did to learn organic chemistry and how I taught organic chemistry. And it was to do a, visualization with my students to shrink down to molecular scale and watch these uh, molecules dance. Now, physicists often talk about it as billiard balls colliding with each other, but it's not that at all. It's their shaped electronic clouds that have electropositive and electronegative sites. And just like North and South Poles on a magnet or similarly, they'll orient to each other. So they really dance and then the electrons shift and you get a new product or products. Um, but it's a contact process. And for me, the reason that I love making things is that it's a contact process. I get to handle the materials. I get to uh, talk to them. I literally talk to them and listen for their voice. And then when I'm thinking about a project, an example would be, say that I, oh, was doing a project about machines. 
obviously I'd want to, I mean, modern machines, let's say, I would want to use metal because metal has certain qualities to it and they were used in machines. Wood also, you know, for earlier machines. And this comes out of, you know, after I got out of uh, academic chemistry, I studied alchemy for years and I build furnaces and on my website, you can see some of that stuff. And the alchemists all perceived what was going on around them as uh, extensions of their in, uh, inner processes. And so it was recognizable and it allowed them to make a connection to materials. Now it turned out to be anthropomorphizing uh, materials, maybe a little bit more than I'd like to go, but it was listening to the voice of that material. And, uh, you know, and I, I have talked about chemistry, but uh, I love science. But the thing that bugs me about science is uh, at the heart of science is the philosophy of science. And at the heart of that or early on, you've got Baconian philosophy and you've got Cartesian philosophy. And Descartes, with his famous cogito ergo sum, you know, I think, therefore I am, uh, he came up with that. This is the legend. I haven't confirmed it but he crawled into a cold furnace, like a womb, to figure out what he could totally believe. And what he came up with were his own thoughts. Well, that's a little isolating, I think. You know, if you can only believe your own thoughts, and a lot of philosophy has gone uh, that down that uh, route. And uh, so for Kierkegaard, of course, it's the night of faith, and night of faith cannot describe their thoughts in a cogent way, or at least they can be cogent, but not maybe in a compelling way, because it's a leap of faith. It's a long jump. Science is a lot of short jumps, but alchemy actually brought emotion into it, and it becomes subjective, and I think we need to have a subjective in, uh, relationship to the environment. So that's that's really at the base of, uh, you know, I love science and I went through this uh, long period where I was uh, studying alchemy because part of it was alchemy described materials in ways that I could connect to. You know, I mentioned Mars, God of War, represented by iron. So when I did my book on Mars, I uh, did a sculptural book and then pamphlets to go with it to tell the words, uh, the story in words. But then I represented Mars by three pieces of iron. There was a uh, sand cast iron um, shot that would have been part of a cluster shot, probably uh, fired on a battlefield in, during the Civil War in the South here. And so that represents military Mars, and that was in the box. And then an, um, let's see, a, a chrome steel ball bearing the same size as this little shot that had been fired from a cannon, uh, but it was chrome steel and mere finish. And I called that Mars in his Sunday going to church outfit. You know, it was just pristine and spherical. And then I wanted to bring celestial Mars into it. So uh, an iron nickel meteorite from a strewn field in Namibia. And in the narrative, I talk about those three faces of Mars and you can pick it up and you can feel the weight of Mars, the weight of iron, you know, and you can see the difference between the highly polished piece uh, alloy and the raw piece. And then here's a piece of Mars that came from outer space and it's, you know, a small little piece and it had regmaglipped edges, which means pinched. And so that little fragment flew through the atmosphere on its own. So it, you know, it was probably part of a larger meteorite that fractured out in the outer atmosphere and then all these little pieces rained and they found tens of thousands of these things uh, within this 10 by 30 kilometer strewn field in Namibia. And so can you just imagine that fiery rain that was Mars coming to Earth um, in all these little glowing bits of meteorite. So uh, you know, so the materials have voices, the materials have history. Uh, one of the things that I um, talked about when I was a student of philosophy was uh, that, you know, we have reflexive uh, memory and intelligence. We can think about something and talk to someone and then reflect on that and just run it uh, in circles. And we can do that. And some people really run in circles with it. Um, but 
material has a memory too, but it's not a self-reflexive memory, but it carries every mark of everything that made it uh, its whole life. And maybe it's been, you know, recycled and transformed. Well, some of that early stuff is still in there. It's kind of like when I'm teaching, uh, you know, leather binding and someone asks, oh, is this sewing good enough? Uh, it's kind of lumpy. And, I'm going, you know, it's usually a conversation, what kind of spine do you want? And smooth spine. Well, what are you going to have to do to that spine in order to make this lumpy sewing smooth on the leather? Going to have to introduce a lot of lining, sand it down. What's that going to do to flexibility? It's going to stiffen the book and it'll make it less user friendly. Unless the text of the book is on stubbornness, I wouldn't go that way. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an early it's like the foundation. Sewing is a foundation. You got to do it all right. None of it get, gets hidden. So um, I always go right to the beginning and say, what do you know about this material? What do you, well, what do you want to express? That's where you start. If you come up with a story first, what do you want to express? What would help you express that? What kind of movement? What kind of form? What kind of material? What kind of imagery? What kind of text? And so all those things get integrated into uh, the work. This, uh, this uh, theme of uh, memory of materials reminded me of uh, something I think I read uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the book by Hawkins uh, mm. uh, about, uh, I, I'm not sure if, if that's uh, his original idea or something, but he, he was uh, talking about religion and about uh, 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 gods and other things. And uh, uh, he, he, at some point he, he uh, writes that, uh, we all consist of atoms that were created in some distant stars millions mm -hmm. of years ago. So uh, in some way, we are parts of these distant stars or something mm -hmm. like that. And that's, that's what can be grander than this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that light connects it. That light that left that star is the one touching your, your eye, you know, and giving you that vision. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I do yeah. find a connection that way that you lose, you know, when you're virtual like this, because then all of the, the light energy is being converted into pixels. And then it's kind of like a trans, uh, oh, what's that called in Star Trek? A, a, a transporter, you know, our images are being transported. <laughs> um, what else, uh, Pablo? You, you, you... Yeah, yeah. When I heard of your triple interests of bookbinding, alchemy, and philosophy, at first I thought, what an unusual combination. And then, of course, I immediately realized how traditional it actually was. There is a library in Amsterdam called Biblioteca Philosophica Hermetica. It uh, is a wonderful, small, dedicated library um, which, uh, which deals uh, exclusively with old books on alchemy. Yes. Oh. Uh, and, of and of course, alchemy and book arts have always been this wonderful amalgam giving mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, bo uh, to both sides. So many symbols, so many techniques came from alchemy to book mm -hmm. arts. Oh, and uh, yeah, last time I was in Amsterdam, I, well, I've been there a couple of times. I haven't seen that museum. Next time I'm definitely going to that museum. That'll be uh, uh, Ben Elbel and I are um, going to do a uh, one of his pamphlets on wire edge binding. It's the first time you'll uh, use that format that he's developed. Uh, for someone else's invention. So I'll be there. Uh, we were going to do it this year, but we had to put, put it off till next year. But I'll go to that museum, Pavel. I'll probably ask you to remind me of uh, the name. Um, yeah, and you know, the alchemists call themselves artists. I just thought that that was wonderful because they were um, looking at their environment and responding to their environment, trying to understand their environment. They were doing it physically. Um, through furnace work, uh, you know, that would be dry alchemy and then wet work would be a solution chemistry, what we call that now. Um, but uh, um, my favorite person who was in transition from alchemy to chemistry is Johann Rudolf Glauber, who was in Germany uh, 1400s or 1500s. I'm not gonna remember now, maybe 1500s. And his writing is all alchemical writing and symbols, but he considered himself a chymist, not an alchemist, a chymist with a C-H-Y um, spelling. And, uh, oh, he invented a lot of things, Glauber salts, he, uh, uh, you know, purified that. 
but his writing is so poetic because he's using mythology. And uh, one of his uh, short little articles uh, was called On Elias the Artist. And then there was a page long subtitle that went along with it talking about Elias. But uh, he talks in this short writing about how uh, Perseus delivered Andromeda from the sea monster and, uh, and actually talks about uh, how to do that. And I've reproduced that. Well, Perseus turns out in his uh, writing to be an amalgam of tin, which would be Jupiter and uh, Mercury. So uh, born of those two uh, metals and uh, Andromeda is the same as Luna, it's silver, and the sea monster is aqua fortis, so if you take, and which is uh, nitric acid. So if you take silver, Andromeda, and drop it in hot nitric acid, Andromeda disappears. She goes into solution. So that's what he was talking about there, and uh, the sea monster devouring Andromeda. And then if you put that amalgam, just mercury itself will do it. But if you drop that in there, the silver reappears on that droplet of mercury as a crystalline arbor diana. Uh, it's a silver tree and it's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And that's um, Perseus delivering Andromeda from the sea monster. So that's a way of looking at the environment that really inspired me. See, chemistry inspires me because it's great storytelling, but some people take it so literally. I mean, I don't know that uh, an electron really exists, does it? But it's a, it's a great concept. It's really a, uh, a very uh, elegant and efficient way to talk about material on that level. It really works, but, you know, I don't know. Does it? Is it? Is it really what, what we all say it is? It's a great story, though. Uh, which is great for me because alchemy is a great story too. And they go together really well. And I, could, I brought that into my sculptural books for years, using that as the inspiration for what I was trying to do in my book work. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Daniel, for being with us today. It was really insightful and uh, uh, it was really interesting to hear your story. Uh, many thanks to our viewers and special thanks to our patrons and supporters on Patreon uh, who make uh, editing of these uh, podcast videos possible and cover our expenses. Uh, I'd ask uh, some of you who haven't joined the crowd on Patreon to think about it. Pledges start with only $1 or, or one euro, depending on where in the world you reside. Uh, we plan a lot of new things uh, to add to, to our podcast this year, including a French speaking uh, host uh, to talk to French speaking guests. <laughs> and uh, if you are ready to support us uh, uh, with your money, please uh, uh, check the link below. Uh, you will see some of the names of our supporters on the screen. And uh, thanks again. Thank you again, Pavel. Thanks, uh, Daniel. I hope to see you once again later this year. Good. Thank you so much, both Stepan and, and Pavel. I really uh, enjoyed this and appreciate uh, that you're taking the time. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye. You too.